Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandip Shandarana with PUA, and we welcome Gail Kelly of Construction Risk uh, Management Consultants uh, here. Uh, first of all, we appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy schedules to uh, attend this webinar with us. We're excited. We've got a great topic here today, climate change and the standard of care for design professionals. Uh, this web webinar is a team effort. Uh, it's hosted by ourselves, PUA, who is the uh, MGA of Arch Insurance Company, uh, and then Construction Risk LLC, who does uh, risk management for our Arch uh, program as well. Uh, so let's quickly review a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, everyone will be muted during the presentation. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please uh, enter them through the chat or the question box there on the webinar, and we will periodically uh, stop the webinar and, and ask any pertinent questions. Uh, secondly, uh, for those looking for continuing education credits, um, this is a self-reporting webinar, so uh, all architects and engineers who attend can request a certificate of attendance from us, uh, and that information will be provided at the end of the, uh, the webinar. So. Uh, with that, we're going to get started here. Um, we'll go over today's agenda and we'll talk a little bit about uh, PUA itself. So um, let's move on. So PUA, we were formed in 1990. Uh, like I said, we're the MGA for Arch Insurance Company and for a lot of the uh, architects and engineers in attendance. Uh, that just means that we're the underwriting agency for Arch Insurance Company. We perform all the underwriting uh, for Arch and, and the company that insures you is Arch Insurance Company. Our Arch is A plus 15 admitted, which uh, by AM Best, which is about as strong of a, a rating as a company could have. Uh, so rest assured that you're, you're in good shape there. Um, PUA ourselves, uh, we do, uh, actually this year, we're gonna finish the year over 70 million in gross written premium. Uh, we insure over 1500 insureds. Uh, we specialize in four lines of insurance. So the architects and engineers that this uh, webinar is focused towards. Uh, we also write design build contractors, uh, miscellaneous professional liability, and then we provide excess limits. Uh, strong paper and broad coverage, like I mentioned, Arch Insurance Company is our admitted brand. Uh, we also have Lloyd's on an ENS uh, basis. And uh, really, what we do is we assist our agents in navigating through the most difficult, complex risks and issues. Um, and this this webinar here, we do them quarterly. Uh, it's a value add um, that we add, offer to all Arch insureds. Um, and what does that include? In addition to these webinars, we also provide unlimited contract reviews through uh, Gale's firm, Construction Risk LLC. Um, and with that, uh, we also will direct you to PUA University, uh, where we've got all of our old webinars uh, hosted there. So you can view this one as well as any others on our website, uh, puainc.com. Uh, so as far as the learning objectives here, uh, we'll discuss the impact of climate change and extreme weather events on property insurance and design professionals' responsibilities. We'll learn how these growing risks are affecting owners and developers and how they are reshaping the standard of care for design professionals. So we'll cover the design professional's responsibility to mitigate against damage from extreme weather events through thoughtful design. Secondly, we'll, we'll cover the potential changes to the standard of care to address risks arising from extreme weather events. We'll also uh, cover the sources of guidance with respect to designing for extreme weather events. And lastly, we'll go over some case law examples related to climate change and extreme weather events. So uh, with that, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to our esteemed host, Gail Kelly. Uh, and Gail, Gail, take it away. Thank you, Sandip. <clears throat> Thank you, Sandip. And, and to echo what Sandip say, we, we appreciate people joining us. Um, I think probably all of us are maybe overwhelmed with with webinar invites in, in general and possibly climate change uh, webinars in specific because it is a topic that is, is generating a lot of concern um, in a lot of different areas. And one of the, the first issues is, is, you know, some of the terminology can be a little bit confusing. 
Um, there's global warming, there's climate change, there's sustainability, there's resilience. And uh, the uh, definitions I've put up here are from the uh, NOOA, the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency, which is the federal agency, which is, is kind of in charge of monitoring and providing information on, on these topics. But um, I think global warming was, was the original concept and that has been brought into this issue of climate change um, where, you know, what is, what is really happening to the climate where it's significant specifically with respect to designers and engineers is um, the, the fact that built structures or the, the built environment uh, is responsible. And again, I, the figure that you see a lot is thrown out is 40% of the greenhouse gas, em, uh, gas emissions. And that comes from, you know, basically the energy used to manufacture the materials, the construction materials, whether it's concrete, uh, well, actually cement, steel, um, other materials. So that actually is a very big concern for um, in the design industry and specifically the, the associations or the manufacturers. And so you will you will actually probably have all gotten invites from, from some of the trade associations, National Ready Mix or, you know, the concrete block people. And so they're looking at ideas of, uh, reducing greenhouse gases with the understanding is that built structures are, are, you know, really using, I mean, very responsible for, responsible for a lot of, of some of the, the issues with greenhouse gases. Um, that's not what we're going to talk about today. What we're going to talk about today is actually, design, which is a, you know, it's, it's related somewhat, but, but a kind of a different uh, topic is designing for ex extreme weather events. So next, um, an extreme weather events is, is just a very broad category that um, is, you know, probably the, the best definition is something that makes the news and causes a lot of damage. And, and, and you know, that's not a, maybe a good definition or scientific, but um, that's, that's probably a helpful way of understanding it. And although there's not a, you know, necessarily a direct correlation or a provable correlation with climate change and extreme weather events, what is generally recognized is that um, the climate change and global changes are actually increasing both severity and the uh, frequency of extreme weather events. And these are actually uh, nationwide in the U.S., nationwide globally. Of course, we, you know, in the U.S., we hear more more it, news about uh, our own problems, but it's actually a, a global problem. So that um, that is one that is actually kind of to to focus on, or what the focus of what this talk will be will be designing for extreme weather events. What we as design professionals have an obligation to design for them, to consider them, um, how, how extreme weather events affect us. Uh, next. And this is actually a slide from 2021, which was a, the most recent graphic I could find. But, and again, graphics sometimes are, are helpful, you know, maybe not to, to impart a lot of information, but helpful to, to kind of show what we're talking about. And it is, it is a nationwide issue. There's different events in, you know, problems in, in maybe different parts of the country, but there is a uh, certainly a, a concern nationwide. I mean, we hear, hear a lot about climate change and, and rising a sea level, um, but you'll notice that, you know, a lot of these little graphics are, are nowhere near the sea, and it's in fact, you know, concentrated in, in the middle of the country. Um, I don't know if there's a more recent graphic, but I think it, it you know, it, it will not have changed uh, substantially as far as what's actually being shown. Next. And so that is actually uh, kind of the timing of, of this webinar is um, the, the most recent hurricane, which uh, took a lot of people by surprise. And that's kind of pointed out to a lot of people that, 
these these extreme weather events and climate change is not just rising sea level and it's not just you know tornadoes that you occasionally you know or, or you know hear about but um it can it can cause devastation everywhere um for a variety of reasons and what's actually interesting is that uh, new york times has, has done a, a sequence of articles on um extreme weather events and the fact that Americans are still moving and in fact moving in record numbers to some of the areas that are, are most prone to extreme weather events. And that is uh, you know, not an indictment of, of anybody's choices or, or whatever, but it is something that's um, you know, it, it is recognized. And one of the things that's actually happening now though is to the extent that it's becoming more difficult to get insurance or much more expensive, that is actually to some extent uh, looking at, you know, affecting people's buying decisions uh, or, or moving decisions. And again, I mean, it's, it, this, this references coastal problems in vacation houses, um, but certainly the problems in, in Asheville had, had nothing to do, they had nothing to do with the coast. So um, that is, um, it is a nationwide concern. So next. And this is actually what, what the New York Times put together is, is, I think, in working with the realtors is um, looking at some of the major issues in, in all of the states and what happens, you know, what, what is happening and what the risks are. And Florida and, and California are something that, you know, everybody would, would be aware of. Um, you know, probably the Carolinas might not be something that, that a lot of people uh, you know, extreme weather would not be something that immediately sprung, sprung to your mind, but uh, it still is a concern. Um, it's, it's still, a, but it's a concern in every state. I mean, there was, you know, devastating flooding in Vermont, which I think last year, which, you know, didn't, didn't reach some of the, the major indicators because um, there was a tornado or a hurricane happening at the same time. But move, uh, next, please. So that what what is actually so I mean there's you know the the graphic showed a number of of extreme weather events and there's tornadoes there's hurricanes uh, the you know extreme cold um, which was the the issue in Houston um, a few years back there's extreme heat um, and that has caused a lot of problems because it exacerbates other problems but what actually happens is that one of the biggest causes of uh, any kind of, from, from our perspective as, as design professionals or in the insurance uh, professionals, is flooding is the the most common uh, damage causing extreme weather event. And part of that is because there's a lot of different causes for flooding, and there's also uh, other things can exacerbate flooding. So that um, the the example that's, that's quite often cited is that when you have when you've had uh, a long period of drought, you lose a lot of the vegetation that is protecting either, you know, hillsides or, or uh, stream banks or, or, you know, providing, preventing some of the, the damage that you might get from a flooding. Once you've lost that vegetation and there is flooding, that you will now have exacerbated your, your problem with uh, any kind of damage being caused. And so the the most, you know, said the most common well, they say, uh, I say the most common, you know, kind of flooding is that um, reason for flooding is that, and it's either uh, a large amount of rain or uh, snow melt, which, you know, we, we probably a lot of us don't think about, but there's a snow melt up in the mountains that comes down and um, most rivers have, you know, the dam systems keep it, keep it or manage it, but um, sometimes it, it's not possible. And so that's an extreme amount of water coming down in a small amount of time. And the same thing when, when you see some of the statistics that the weather statistics is that there's been, you know, the entire year's normal year's rainfall in, in one day, um, very seldom is, is that going to be easy to handle. So that one of the, the you know, this kind of uh, lists a, a number of different types of flooding um, but there's really not a lot of significance to, to how you describe the flooding. Um, it's just trying to get an understanding of how 
or, or to show that there's a lot of different reasons that there could be flooding. And one of the things that is not listed here, which is, you know, has becoming more and more common is urban flooding to the extent that you have uh, backed up storm, storm sewers. And that's a, a little bit of a domino effect that you have a, a problem with that. And that's, you know, some of the things that is is easier maybe to address than other issues, easier not meaning cheaper, um, but you have a lot of the major cities are looking at putting some kind of combined sewer overflows so that you have somewhere to temporarily, temporarily store large amounts of water. Uh, next. And so that the the issue is, and, and again, I mean, it's kind of a, a discussion that goes on uh, a lot of a lot of talk and, and maybe not a lot of action. But um, what should we do? What can be done? Um, what what should we require to do? And there's at this point in time, there's not there's not a way to move back. Um, there's you know the sea level rise is a reality, whether it's the what caused it and whether it's going to cause the drastic, you know, problems that, that, you know, people, some people have been anticipating is really not the issue um, or, or maybe not the major issue, but, uh, you know, is that's one of the major concerns that people have been trying to address is, is sea level rise. But if we look at that, um, it's really not been particularly successful because there's, there's guidances, there's guidelines, um, there's suggestions, but there's there's no coordinated there's no coordinated all over you know generically applicable requirement. And what you get is in each city or a lot of the major cities have addressed for the the um, the public buildings they can make requirements. A city can, it's very difficult for the city to make. Um, requirements as far as, as design or what can be done for private projects. And one of the reasons is, ob not obviously, but, but it's one of the reasons is because those kind of decisions have a, can have a significant effect on real estate prices. Um, and that is one of the issues with any type of re regulatory environment or statutory change. Um, it could severely impact what a, a house is worth, um, what the insurance is required for the house, whether land now has become unbuildable, you know, where, whereas last year it was actually, you know, could be developed into a, a large development or a, a significant uh, apartment building. So that's, I mean, it's a very difficult issue to, to navigate. And that's, you know, not, not making a lot of headways on, on a lot of fronts. Um, so that what you know, and this isn't this isn't actually what what you know I have any expertise in, in addressing, but what I would what we're going to think about now or consider now is um, what we as design professionals, you know, the kind of bottom bottom of the of the screen question is um, whether we can be held liable for failing to anticipate the effects of climate change and by extension extreme weather. Um, and to the extent that some of us are involved in, in planning or, or uh, land use or, you know, kind of bro broader framework, um, you know, those, those things come in there. But we're kind of going to look at very specifically what is what is the standard of care for design? So next. And that's the two issues is um, or. You know, and two of the major issues um, with respect to the risk as design professionals are the professional standard of care and uh, the risk arising out of, um, I'm going to say, the client design decisions um, with the, the understanding it's the, the failure to warn. Um, and failure to warn is what was made uh, not popular, what was it came, you know, brought to everybody's attention was the McDonald's hot coffee cup. Um, and that's why your the lid to your coffee cup now has the warning, caution, contents are hot. And, and not meaning to, to be flipped because, you know, somebody somebody uh, was seriously injured in that event and, and similar events. But that is the idea of failure to warn. 
that if somebody, not necessarily a design professional, knew or should have known, and the should have known is the important part, but knew or should have known of, you know, so, some issue where somebody could get hurt, the design professional could be held liable. Um, and the, the coffee, McDonald's coffee cup was, was some years ago, more recently was the Surfside collapse in Florida. And the ultimately the entity that was found most liable uh, for the, the settlement um, was the security firm, which uh, for two reasons, um, one, because they had insurance coverage and, you know, one of the goals of, of the settlement was to make people as whole as, as possible, you know, under the circumstances. So the, the security, the, you know, the, the security firm had a, had a very substantial policy, but more to the, you know, more specifically as a security guard knew there was a problem or should have known there was a problem and should have alerted people. And so that's kind of what, what that hung on was um, the security guards should have alerted people. Um, and I guess there's, there's specifics about that, but, but just goes to, you know, shows us that the, this idea of failure to warn is not, is, is a general concept and it, it applies to all, you know, across all businesses or, you know, all, all parts of, of society or all parts of, of commerce. So, um, and there's no, and like I said, there's no, Legal precedents, meaning a previous cases or, or you know, uh, litigation specifically related to professional liability risks due to extreme weather events. Um, there's been no litigation that uh, you should have designed for a tornado um, and you didn't. Um, there's been a lot of issues with respect to um, mobile home usage in certain places um, and whether, you know, they, they tend to be the ones that, you know, are devastated by any kind of tornado or hurricane when they can be used, um, where they can be used. That, again, becomes kind of a, a socioeconomic issue is that um, that's people's housing that you say that, that they can't be used anymore. Um, so that, again, that's, that's kind of beyond the, the remit of, of a kind of the standard concerns of a, of a design professional, um, but it is actually part of, of the concerns of this overall designing for ex extreme weather event is that um, you, passing certain laws or, or requiring or not requiring certain things can have significant uh, socioeconomic effects. So... Uh, next, please. So I said the the two issues were were that the, for the you know again the the stamp for us as design professionals was the standard of care and the duty to warn. So the standard of care I, maybe needs no introduction, but but I'll still you know address it briefly. But it is something that uh, is kind of central to the the you know design profession is that. Um, what can, what are we held to? What standard are we held to? Um, and if we don't meet that standard, because if we don't meet that standard, it's negligence. And that's what we can be held liable for um, if there's, if there's an issue. And that's when we, as we, as construction risk, we do a lot of contract reviews. Um, and that's one of the things that we look at is that um, what is our, make sure that our standard of care is appropriately defined. We don't we don't agree to to provide the best services. We don't provide agree to to you know guard against all risks. What we guard against is the requirement that that the standard of any other design professional in the same circumstances would be do, do the same thing as we did. Um, and there's there's that there's what we call the industry standard form documents and it's. You, you probably most of you, the AIA, the EGCDC, the consensus docs, uh, DBIA, and they all for for the, for the design professionals, and they all have some formulation of the standard of care. And the wording might be a little bit different, but the the important part is is the part at the bottom. It's a standard, the skill, the care and skill, ordinarily used by members of the design professional practicing under similar conditions at the same time and locality of the project. And it's so, so no matter how it's worded, 
It's what another design professional would have done or what your your ideal, your 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 gold standard, not your gold standard, but what your typical design professional, what they would agree was required under those circumstances. Okay. So what so I said that you know there's in the industry standard forms, there's um, slightly different wording for what's considered the standard of care, but what is um, common to all of them is that um, the standard of care applies to the circumstances and the location. And so that's where, you know, kind of the, the looking at these, these issues of climate change is a possibility that the, the or, or consideration that um, what are the likely effects of climate change in this project location? Um, because, you know, maybe a mobile home has a, you know, not expected to last that long. Buildings, you know, we may be looking at, you know, a 50-year life. For bridges, we're, we're looking at a 50-year life. So, so that is kind of the idea of, um, you know, the project is, is important to a certain extent, but the project location also um, is, is very important. And that's, not actually a new concept to the standard of care because for those of you in in uh, either Texas or, or California, that's certainly in California is seismic concerns. Actually, the, I shouldn't leave out Washington or state in, in Oregon because it's, it applies actually all along the West Coast. Um, but you as, as a design professional need to design for seismic concerns. Um, in Texas, you have the, the expansive clays. So that that is what's considered a the standard of care for a design professional in Texas is different than, than the design professional in Tennessee. Um, so that's that's something that that is well acknowledged. But what might be different or, or the, this idea of uh, designing for extreme weather events is that not only are we need to address current situations, we need to anticipate future con conditions. So next. And so that's, um, that's, that's, again, it's, it's the duty, the standard of care. Um, does the design professional have a duty to consider future risks that could arise from climate change slash extreme events or, and adapt its, its design accordingly? Um, and the standard of care is, I mean, essentially the idea of foreseeability, and that's not just Design professionals, it's it's all any kind of negligence, whether it's you know the a truck driver or anybody else. Um, it's a you have a duty to prevent damage to prevent damage if it's reasonably foreseeable that an action could create cause the damage. So that's I mean that's a concept that that's well understood or, or, or kind of permeates all all areas of society. Um, but it's also not, I mean, it's a little bit vague. Um, and that's where the question comes in is, does it, you know, what, what is foreseeable with respect to the future? Um, and how do you, how do you foresee the future? Which is, which is something that, you know, it's, it's, so some people, you know, that, that's where the differences of opinion come in. So next. And one of the things, and this is, I mean, not just related to, to climate change, but all design issues is that um, compliance with the, with the applicable building code is not sufficient or generally not sufficient to satisfy the standard of care. And, and the kind of throw off, you know, the, the, the buzzwording is the, stand, the building code sets a floor, not a ceiling. So that if you don't comply with the standard, the building code, um, you're generally felt not to agree, you know, not to comply with the standard of care. It's not enough just complying with the building code. And so that's, you know, specifically with respect to climate change and historical and, and weather data is that the, the building codes all incorporate historic weather data. And as, you know, we're seeing more and more is that um, and again, you know, you can argue all you want, but it is changing um, so that historical data does not necessarily represent uh, current or future, you know, current or even future or even current events. 
Um, with respect to some of the things that are, are causing the damage or are likely to cause the damage. And the other thing that's, that's a consideration that, you know, maybe too far in the weeds, but, but, you know, engineers and design professionals understand that is that you have the building code, which is what's called a model code that is not effective until it's adopted as a state code. Um, and I can tell you that the, the uh, building codes, the I codes come out every three years but some of the states are still using the 2012 codes. And again, I mean, that's theoretically, there's, there's nothing wrong with an old code except to the, the extent, and that specifically with respect to um, climate change, where every cycle on the codes has kind of look, taken a look back and seeing where things have to be tightened, where things have to be more restrictive, what didn't work in, in a certain situation. but um, there's there's a fair amount of cost involved in, or often fair amount of cost involved in, in changing codes so that um, a lot of states don't, you know, regularly update their building codes. Um, furthermore, even though the, the international, IB, like the IBC is the, the one that people are probably most familiar with, those are, are updated on a three-year cycle. Um, the standards, and by standards, I mean a lot of people are familiar with the ASTM standards, um, the FEMA standards, other standards, which are, are third party kind of technical documents that are that are incorporated into the codes uh, by reference so that that they're not actually you know, developed by the codes they are just included in, in the codes. Um, they may be, you know, and quite often are, are not incorporated. They're not updated every 10 years. So they also don't necessarily include some of the, what is known to be required changes for a particular area um, based on changes, you know, the, the overall uh, changes to the, the environment. Um, the, so, so having, you know, those two are the, um, one of the issues is that in, it's even the most recently published standards. So the standards are only, revised every say every 10 years or, or five years even so i mean it's a it's a lengthy procedure there was called consensus based so there's a lot of voting um and so that's i mean that's something to to be aware of the the building code is not going to be um even the most current building code is not going to have the most current data incorporated so okay next slide and so one of the most the, the most relevant ASCE the most relevant standard for flooding is AEC 24. And that is something that's referenced a lot. Um, it was, the current version is the, 20, the four, year 2014. Um, a new version is coming out um, and it's it was under public review and, and comment. Um, and one of the issues is it's made more restrictive requirements in, in a lot of uh Places again to to um, to address what's what's seen as the acknowledged risk. Um, that means higher construction costs um, and higher design costs, and so that is is not you know just something that that needs to be uh, accepted. So next, what as part of the uh, in addition to the ASCE twenty four, which American Society of Civil Engineers, um, FEMA puts out technical bulletins, and those are actually referenced in the ASC 24, and what those are as um, they're actually, you know, addressed for the, the state and floodplain management officials are addressed to, to help them interpreting um, management criteria, but they also have, um, you know, some, some good recommended best practices for reducing flood losses. Um, something that, that may be important is um, the flood insurance rates, and they also have references to the code of standards. So, um, next, please. So these are some of the, they're called TBMs, technical bulletins. Um, and these are actually, you see that there's, there's one actually, again, you're talking about the, the things don't necessarily get updated that often. Um, the, there's a 2008 um, version, and it, but all of the other ones have been, you know, updated fairly regularly, fairly frequently because of, you know, past issues, past problems. 
The other, next please, the other um, good source of, uh, next, oh, I'm sorry, no, uh, um, the other good source of information for design professionals is vendor presentations. Specifically, there's, there's certain vendors that have, um, that sell or, or manufacture or, or design uh, specific you know, I think a lot of people have seen the flood resistance gates, um, certain materials or whatever, uh, and not necessarily, um, you know, not to promote one or the other, but they tend to be very careful about telling you this complies with FEMA, this comply the FEMA NFIP requirements, it complies with ASC 24. So that is a good way to educate yourselves about what's available, is look at what is actually being sold for addressing some of the problems. And one of the, one of the issues, unfortunately, with, with respect to the flooding and the flooding issues is that um, what I said here has become kind of a, a political football um, on the federal level. And uh, in 2015, there was an attempt to um, increase, you know, some of the requirements for flooding, increase resilience. What that meant was increased costs. And this is actually specifically just for federal buildings or federal, I'm sorry, for, for public projects um, that are federally funded, which is turns out is, is quite a few, even the state projects are, are federally funded. Um, but having stricter requirements on the floodplain um, and the elevations, increased costs limited where you could build. Next, please. Um, so that's uh, subsequently, you know, before it was fully implemented, that requirement to increase or, or make it, you know, more restrictive for floodplains was revoked. Um, and I think the the uh, for for primarily under the, the the claim that it was, you know, increasing costs. But um, I think that uh, some of the federal agencies got around it for under certain other requirements just because it it was clear to them that those were necessary things that need to be done. Um, then in 2021, um, this was uh, kind of reinstated the, the increased flooding issues or the, the increased flooding protections. And this is more um, in floodplains, meaning, you know, the kind of the large flat areas on either side of, of the rivers or uh, some of the deltas where you can have um, a very small amount of flooding can cause a huge amount of damage because, it's, it's generally pretty flat so that it's it can be devastating even even a minor flood so next so the, there's a lot of complaint and kind of central to, to FEMA is the flood insurance rate maps the firms um, a lot of complaints because they're not updated as often as they should be um, there's complaints because they're not digitized in certain places uh, in Vermont, that was one of the complaints when there was flooding in, in Vermont that they were very hard to, to figure out. Uh, but again, um, when they are increased or when they make it um, more restrictive, it affects some of these property values. So, I mean, if you're the if you're the house seller, um, you do not want a, a new flood map that puts your house in a floodplain. Um, and it is. I mean, it's it's can be significant. So that there is there is a certain amount of um, you know even at that level uh, dispute or, or or argument over over the requirements. So next, um, but so those but those are those are actually once they get into the building code um, ASC twenty four and the the flood insurance rate maps the the NIFP technical doc, those are the law. Um, what we've seen in a lot of big cities and even smaller cities is that they have provided um, guidance, they, uh, maybe requirements for public building or something that's that's publicly funded, um, or it might be just guidance. And some of it, you know, is, is common sense, which um, is you don't put electrical equipment in a basement that um, is a potential floodplain. And again, I mean that's that's the cheapest area, so. You know, historically, that's where, you know, some some not, you know, some equipment was put. So that's you. You have guidance that says that's that's not a policy that should be um, should be followed. That kind of information, even if it's not a um, even if it's not a requirement and even though it might require, you know, apply just to private to public projects, 
um, is something that is very good for even divine professionals on private projects to, to be aware of. And that, that call, kind of falls under what did the design professional know or should have known? And they should have known that, that there's this, this guideline out there that um, is being required to for public projects. Why, why didn't they apply it to the, their private project? Next. Um, so that the, the, you know, this is kind of all leading up to it. Does, is, a, is a standard of care changing? Should it change? Will it change? Um, and the, the wording, you know, kind of, you know, looking at it, the wording is probably not going to change. Um, and really the, the significance is not going to change, but the, still the, the concept of, of the, the building codes relying on the building codes, um, is not enough to comply with the standard of care. And it may, you may be expected to, to look at other sources of, of information or other places for guidance. And at some point in time, the, the building codes, you know, may be updated. So at that point in time, the, the, there's kind of a, an easier uh, to follow guidance. But um, as, as we, you know, discussed is that there's a, a very significant lag between the, the acknowledgement of this, this code needs to be changed and maybe how that the code in this particular city or town is actually the existing code. So next, please. So that one of the things that um, is important as a design professional um, is that we do not warrant our services to be either perfect or defect fee, defect free. We will warrant only that we will comply with the, the standard set by other design professionals working under the same conditions. Um, and what we want to be careful about is warranting that any kind of warrant that, you know, will it'll comply with a, a guideline for uh, climate change or uh, future projections of, of climate change, because uh, very ba the basic is, uh, issue is that most likely it will affect the project costs. Um, it will be something that the owner has to agree to, um, and very seldom do you get um, at least willing participation in something that's going to be significantly more expensive that can't be proven to be necessary. Um, so that we, I mean, that's, that needs to be taken into consideration, but it is not something that, that we can guarantee or warrant. The other thing that's a little bit of a concern is um, a warranty or, or some kind of obligation that's based on cutting edge technology. And that's, you know, just a, a general framework, but cutting edge technology, meaning materials that have only been used for, you know, a short period of time or not been used in that same location, um, you don't, or, or a similar location, um, you, you know, people typically don't have an understanding of in five years, how will it, how will it behave over, over five years? Is there something where, you know, what initially worked didn't work? because due to degradation or, or some kind of failure in long-term performance. And again, I mean, it's not, it's a, a kind of general, you know, speculative, not speculative, but, but, you know, not very specific guidance, but there is a concern specifically with, with insurance companies when they're, when they're looking at something that um, it was a new material and, you know, had not been proven, it had not been proven for, for that uh, environment. So next, please. Uh, we talked about the duty to warn, the duty to inform, um, you know, different uh, kind of different ways of looking at it. Um, and what we see, you know, when we review contracts is, uh, especially the owner drafted contracts, will be something like um, this is, you know, the owner is relying on the design professional for their expertise. The design professional is the expert uh, where, where, you know, we're, we're putting kind of all of the risk on you. Um, the design professional. And that's really not appropriate to the extent that as, as design professionals, we are not generally experts in climate change and modeling and, and anticipating the future. Um, and to the extent that, um, you know, when we, when we look at any contract where it uses, you know, says that we're the expert in something, uh, we might change it and say we have experience in doing something um, but we do not want to create a, an impression that that 
uh, somehow create a higher standard of care. Um, and again, that's um, there are firms that are becoming, um, you know, kind of, there are firms, you know, sometimes it's a, some of the bigger design firms and also specialty firms that are looking at um, design, designing for, for climate data, climate changes. Um, that's not the typical design professionals. It does not want to design professionals, does not want to agree that, that they will comply with, with some kind of uh, climate change need or climate change adaptation. So next, please. Um, so that's, you know, and, and what it comes down to, again, is, is, you know, will the owner, is it worth it to them the higher costs of investigating and designing for extreme weather events against the risk of liability to the failure, you know, failure to do so? Um, and one of the issues that, you know, some of the places that are desirable places to live, uh, people are building on less desirable land. Um, and that in itself may, may cause a problem. There may be an issue with not just climate change or extreme weather events, but, but other issues. Um, and that has to be you know, looked at a little bit. Um, what, you know, and, and kind of when, when they talk about can a owner say, I don't want to address climate change, you know, I don't want because they're concerned about costs. Yes. I mean, you know, if, um, if the project complies with the building code, um, it's legal, um, you know, it's, it's not going to fail uh, the, the design review. Um, there may be some issues for, for the design professionals and that um, when there is a problem, you know, we'll get back to the duty of, of care, the, the, the duty to warn, and the, the owner will say, well, I wouldn't have done this if I knew. Um, next, just next slide. So that what, I mean, in, in any contract, not just, you know, a, a potentially, you know, risky project is, is we want to make sure that we can rely on owner information or try to rely on, we don't want to have to verify the information. So if they've provided us information about the floodplain, about any climate change risks, um, we do not have an independent requirement or independent obligation to investigate that. So we like to see, you know, some standard wording that says we're entitled to, to rely on owner provided information. Next, please. And that's, um, you know, if, if there is a concern, and again, I mean, I think this is a little bit far down the road, but it's still, you know, kind of something to think about is that we can add a specific disclaimer, um, which is the, the wording in red that, um, the the owner acknowledges and agrees that that we as a design professional can't just you know that's that's not what we do we don't anticipate the effects of climate change um, and that the owner you know may can want to consider analyzing you know having hiring a specialized consultant to to kind of provide design uh, guidance on that so next please um, and that's kind of the the you know, we can have a, a disclaimer. What a disclaimer of responsibility is, um, you know, we use it in a lot of contexts, but um, this is some word, you know, this is wording that could be used that um, we, we, this is what we will do um, very specifically, but to disclaim the fact that we cannot, um, we cannot anticipate future, uh, future problems or, or future events. Um, and that's, um, you know, again, it's not, it's not so much passing the buck or, or not as, assuming liability for, for what we should, but it's acknowledging that we cannot do that. I mean, we're still required to, to comply with the standard of care. If it was obvious that there's something needed to be designed to withstand a potential flood, that probably does fall within our standard of care. What we're talking about is... Um, that we can't, I mean, we cannot anticipate uh, the, the changes, you know, the fact that there's a 100-year a flood uh, three years ago, and now there's another 100-year flood now. Um, that's, that's not within, within our, you know, typical design responsibility. Um, but again, I mean, it's, it's, it's for the idea of foreseeability. If we did not address something that was likely, um, we could be held liable. So that that is, I mean, it's, it's basically being informed, keeping as a design professional, keeping yourself informed, keeping the client informed, 
um, whether it specifically goes in the contract as a disclaimer, um, you know, that's kind of a, a good way of, of making sure or helping to make sure that, you know, things won't be disputed later, but um, it's still the very basic requirement that um, we do need to keep the client informed about things that they should know and by extension, and so by extension, there's things that we need to know. Next, please. So just, I mean, this is just a, a uh, slide to show that, you know, this idea of a disclaimer um, has been around for a while or, and specifically is, is uh, the lead cert certification caused a lot of problems back in, uh, I think it's going to be two th between 2008 and, and about 2011. And it's kind of gone down, you know, kind of gone away and not gone away, but become less of an issue. Um, but this is very specific wording developed by AIA that says um, we can't certify that your building will comply with the lead, um, any any level, specific level, um, because it, it you know involves not only a third party certifying agency, but it also depends on what the owner does and what the contractor does. And that's I mean, it's very analogous to designing for extreme weather events. It's not always it's not entirely within our control. Um, so that's, we want to make sure that we're not taking responsibility for somebody else's uh, failure to, to act accordingly. Next, please. Um, there's other defenses. And again, this is just, you know, general legal, you know, considerations is, is a statute of repose, um, statute of limitations, which are very similar that um, a, a design professional can only be liable for a claim a certain number of years after substantial completion, which it depends state by state has, has a uh, different amount of years. Um, I mean, that's, that can be a very helpful uh, defense um, when the event happened 10 years after we did the design, um, because at that point in time, um, we, we did, you know, we, we've actually uh, complied with our requirements. So the, the other thing is, is the act of God is actually addresses the um, idea of uh, foreseeability. Um, and that, you know, is, is kind of a defense that people try to use. It's not necessarily, and it's actually falling out of favor, especially with respect to client change, that an act of God is not necessarily unforeseeable. Um, and that's that's becoming more and more uh, apparent. So um, going on to litigation examples, um, I said at the beginning, there's not that much recent litigation issues. Um, the There's actually, uh, these litigation is tracked for in a variety of places. Um, and one of the biggest ones is, is at Columbia University Law School. Um, and there's, you know, looking at their database, there's, uh, for, for climate change, um, there's no specific requirements, so there's no specific litigation with respect to extreme weather events. Um, what they do, it hark back to in 1935, um, and again, it had to do with flooding. There was a design that, that didn't accumulate, you know, correctly anticipate flooding. Um, the act of God defense was rejected because similar flooding had happened in the past. Uh, next, please. Um, more recent, again, more recent is, is 50 years ago, um, but it's actually uh, interesting because it reply, applies or refers to the FEMA guidelines, which are still an issue in a lot of litigations. Part of that, I mean, part of the reason there is not reported litigations is a lot of times claims will settle um, or it's arbitrated, so it's, it's not in any litigation database. So, um, so you will see that, but, and again, is that, um, this is interesting to the fact that you don't, as a designer, you don't just have an obligation to your clients. Um, you have an obligation to other people that can be affected by your design. Um, so that is, is something that's becoming more and more of an issue. Next, please. Next. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and this is actually where you say that there's not the, the way the law works is you don't you don't necessarily it's not necessarily this specific issues. You look at other similar cases. Um, and this is one of the more recent ones was the um, the issue of asbestos, um, where what, you know, a, a, an architect designed with this asbestos 
Um, the design was done during the 1950s when asbestos was commonly used. And so, yeah, unfortunately, there was, you know, a, a death uh, 35 years later, you know, allegedly or probably due to the use of, of asbestos in the design. Um, but the, the architect was not found liable because at the time he designed and the idea of new or should have known there was, he, he should not have known. He should not have, have not used that design. There was, it was not his, he was not liable for not knowing what was not publicly known at the time or maybe not known at all. So next please. Um, and as I said before, is that the, the act of God defense, which is, you know, often tried with, with respect to because acts of God, you know, our, our uh, nature or extreme weather events are often considered acts of God. So that is um, often tried to, as a defense. Um, the fact that you frequently have, you know, that same act of God happening in the same place um, is making much more difficult to say that you should not have foreseen it. Um, and these again are, are, you know, fairly older, you know, at least the, the first one is, is older, but um, it's becoming less and less of a, a valid defense. Next, please. So that is kind of a, in, in a, a brief overview and what, you know, just to, to um, kind of summarize with the fact that we've talked about our obligation, we've talked about our duty, what can we be liable for? Um, but the, you know, looking at the, the other uh, responsibility is that or the, the other issues is that if we're involved in a project that that where there was a problem didn't meet the owner's expectations there was alleged damage to third parties that is not a good I mean that can be very damaging to our reputation reputation uh, the other thing is that is you know showing an understanding of extreme weather events um, is is a very good marketing tool not well, not marketing tool but I mean it's, it's a very good it presents a good image to the client, and if we don't, if we aren't able to to show that, uh, we may lose out on business opportunities. So that is uh, all I have to say. Yeah, great job, Gail. Uh, very timely topic here. It seems like you know this is a very evolving topic. Even when you look at your case studies, it's all kind of involving flooding and uh, asbestos and and things from the past. And and so I'm sure there's going to be new case law coming soon. Um, looks like we're short on time. I guess that we had a slew of questions and we'll answer those directly to uh, the questionnaires, but I'm gonna pick one here that I thought was pretty pretty interesting. So um, outside of the standard of care uh, in contracts, are there any other provisions in contracts that address climate change or is it is it solely related to standard of care? Um, I say, I mean, I put in the, the disclaimers, um, we don't warrant, but um, there's, and that's, I guess, would be the, the two other ones, is that, you know, to disclaim, we can't anticipate uh, future, that's that's not within our remit, we say, and, you know, kind of bottom line, we suggest you hire somebody else to, to address it, and they can then tell us, you know, what needs to be designed for, and they will take the responsibility of the fact that, that your building may be significantly more expensive than you expected. Great. And, and I think you touched on it briefly, but uh, how often do disclaimers hold up in a court of law or, or does it just depend on the circumstances? Um, everything depends on the circumstances. A disclaimer, a well-written disclaimer should hold up. I mean, it's, it's something that the parties agree to and that they negotiated, and as part of the fee, I mean, the, the fee involved in, and that's why we, we don't agree to a warranty, because the, except for, the, you know, that will comply with the standard of care, because the owner, you know, will likely say is that, well, that is, that's what we bought. We bought this warranty as part of our, our services, so so we try not to, but the disclaimer should hold up, um, and it's, it's something that, that we, you know, probably will see more of. Great. So uh, again, great job, Gail. Thanks for uh, your, your assistance here with this webinar. Um, for continuing education credits, you can email Brad Lynch at blynch at puainc.com. Uh, again, all architects and engineers must self-report their participation to the AIA for continuing education credits. So we'll give you a certificate and then you can self-report that. 
Uh, a copy of this recording will be sent to everybody that registered. It'll also be on our website, uh, www.poainc.com. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, you can reach direct out directly to Gail or myself. Uh, again, we thank everyone uh, for their time and we wanted to thank Arch Insurance Company uh, for putting this webinar on as well as Construction Risk LLC and PUA. And please feel free to, to reach out with any questions. Thanks again for your time.